Welcome to the Diversity Project Leadership Event. Uh, I have the great honour of introducing Alexandra Altinger. She has 28 years of wealth and asset management experience. She is currently the CEO of J.O. Hambro and has been in this post three, almost three years. She's one of the founding members of the Diversity Project back in 2016, and this is a co clo cause close to her heart. I have also got the great honour to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Langley Sharp. He commissioned into the Parachute Regiment and has served for 23 years in the British Army. He is the former head of the Centre for Armour Leadership. Welcome. Great to be here. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thrilled to be here, Kelly. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah. Uh, so Langley, it's a, re a real pleasure to meet you in person. Likewise. I read your book with a lot of interest um, and thought it was highly insightful. And I suppose maybe I could just kick off and ask you what do you think the key tenets are of leadership in the Army and some of the points that you make in your book. Sure. Um, well, before I answer that, um, if I can just say thanks to Ben and Kelly uh, and the team for inviting us here today. It's a real privilege and, and humble to be uh, sharing the platform, particularly on International Women's Day with such an esteemed leader such as yourself. So thank you very much indeed. Um, so to your, to your question, um, in terms of uh, the book, uh, it's the first uh, holistic and authorised account of British Army leadership. There have been a number of books over the years that talked about leaders through time or the army more broadly but this is the first time where it was all brought together um, and as, as we spoke off camera it was a it was a genuine team effort by um, by, by, by colleagues at the centre for army leadership and what we sought to do was look at leadership through time so it starts off with the history and what makes it uh, unique and then it looks at our core philosophy our doctrine um, and the definition of an army leadership is the character knowledge and action that inspires others to succeed so character is what leaders are uh, knowledge, what they know, and an action, what they do. So there's three chapters that really bring that to life. And then it looks at leadership in context, both through the eyes of officers and soldiers, and in peace and in war. And then finally, uh, a tentative eye on the future, um, and, and what that may bring and changes, um, uh, what may, may endure uh, or evolve uh, or, or change as a result of um, uh, future dynamics. So that's the, 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 the book really. Uh, to your point about the key tenets, it's always difficult to distill a, an, an institutional approach to, to leadership. But I think the defining characteristics are certainly that it's values based. Um, the army is very strong on its values. It's six values of courage, uh, discipline, respect for others, integrity, loyalty and selfless commitment. Um, by example, our, our leaders are expected to, to live and breathe and set the example of those, of those values. And it's also about selfless leadership, serving others, so servant leadership. Um, and the motto of Sanders, as explained in the book, um, is, is serve to lead. And that, that uh, whilst that is being monopolised by the officer corps, it's absolutely relevant to, to all our people. And the final thing, we may get onto some of this, I think it's, it's bound up in this sort of rich regimental culture um, that, that pervades across the army. And of course, leadership affects culture as much as culture affects leadership. And do you reckon that those tenets are still as... Uh, relevant today as they were over time, given that the nature of conflict has changed. And I suppose I'm just looking at, uh, you know, the, 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 the in-person combat, face-to-face um, -face conflict with the likes of the Afghanistan war, mm. um, you know, where you had an invisible enemy, you, you know, it wasn't really clear, you know, how you would define success. So, so perhaps you could just touch on, you know, the character of war and the nature of war and whether whether you've seen that evolve over time and whether those tenets that you've just explained in your book around leadership are still, um, you know, are still the right ones and if, if that has, needs to evolve as well. I think, I think so. What I often say about leadership is that the fundamentals endure, it's just the context that changes. And I, I guess that plays to your, your point about the, the character and nature. And we talk about the character and nature of war, the, na the nature of which is enduring, whereas the character changes uh, over time. And I think the same to a certain extent is, is of leadership. I mean, if you look back at our, at our history and you look at leadership in the army, say 200 years ago <coughs> with Wellington, one of our you know, most heralded leaders, and he really epitomized leadership of the time, which was he was a, an aristocrat uh, and obviously an officer. And, and leadership was very much seen through, through the eyes of the officers and, um, and the aristocracy. And leaders were deemed to be born, not made uh, in that era. And, and, and the tenants there and the characteristics were of honour and physical courage and discipline. And, um, and whilst we live in the same hierarchical uh, rank structure now, um, uh, we operate in a very different environment, of course, and leadership has evolved significantly over that time. 
So really now see leadership is, is everyone's business from private soldier all the way through to our most senior, uh, senior generals. Um, and it's about, as I said, it's about service of others, empowering people to closely align with our philosophy of mission command. So it's about empowering our people to lead and giving our people responsibility and allowing them to, to bring their to bring their best knowledge, skills and experience to, to the problem. So I think leadership in, has, has, has evolved, but the fundamentals of that, of that human uh, interface, which ultimately is what leadership is about. I, also, I often say, if you break leadership down to its raw component parts, it's about an individual influence and another individual or individuals in a team in order to achieve an outcome. Um, and that hasn't changed through time. So it's about influence, it's about um, inspiring people motivating people um, so it's a social social relationship relationship and a, a fundamental human endeavor and i don't think that's changed over time albeit the nature of, of war and the, the environment in which we lead certainly has done mm -hmm. and most of the books you know if you do walk into waterstones or other bookstores around uh, army leadership typically are published by u.s generals or mm -hmm. you know are published with a u.s perspective um, what would you say the difference is between, you know, maybe the way that you define leadership from a UK perspective versus the US, if there is a difference? You know, you, you started your point off by talking about the very long history mm -hmm. um, that is very central, I think, to the way that the UK, you know, army leadership concept has evolved over time. Mm. Um, you know, in the US, you haven't had that kind of history, um, but it feels like it's obviously, you know, a, a big focus as well, you know, driving, driving success. So perhaps you could just touch on the differences between the US and the UK army leadership? Yeah, I'd say there's probably more similarities than differences. And, um, and I guess a lot of that is born of our relationship. Um, you know, they are, they are our key strategic ally. And, um, and regardless of where the political um, relationships are and they ebb and flow in terms of the strength of that relationship, certainly militarily, we've always been very closely aligned, certainly over the last hundred years. So it's, it's not surprising that a lot of our doctrine and our thinking is, is aligned because we work alongside one another. And I think that's the same for leadership. They are very much values based. They have this idea of um, uh, uh, selfless service, et cetera. I think the two, the two areas, and you've touched on them already, that really define a difference. It's hard to sort of quantify. One is um, the, the culture as cultural aspect. Um, and we have a very rich regimental history. Some of our regiments go back to our founding years in 1660, so three and a half centuries, and that's a huge amount of, of history and heritage and tradition um, to, to draw on. And, and we rely on that, as, as many large organisations that have been around for a long time do, because that gives us a strength of, uh, a strength of purpose, um, and it really helps support our, our, our fighting spirit, our, 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 um, the moral component, the will to fight that esprit de corps because you're, you feel a, 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 an ownership and a responsibility to live up to your forebears and the history of your forebears. And that's, and that's really rich within the British Army. M and many other armies have, have uh, um, uh, historical perspectives that they draw on, but I think that the depth and the richness of the British Army is quite unique. And um, so I think that's one aspect. I'd say the other, and, and again, it's hard to quantify, but it's the British soldier. Um, I, I interviewed the uh, General Sir Mark Carton Smith, Chief of the General Staff, a, about a year and a half ago and a similar question actually um and he said it was he he, he said the same it was, it was something about the british soldier that that tenacity that challenge in nature um uh, that, that that doggedness that dogged determination and that humor to see things see things through i think it's a it's a sort of um it's something quite british about it it's hard to hard to hard to pinpoint and and you look at um, historical accounts of soldiers, even in, you know, comparing them from World War One, the trenches of World War One, to soldiers I led in Afghanistan, so over a hundred years later, and that same spirit still um, still fights through, regardless of changes in, in society and, and the world around us. And in terms of COVID, has anything changed in a post-COVID world, with regards to that esprit de corps or that that you know that spirit, that that the way that you define the British soldier? I think, I think it's an interesting time that we're in at the moment. I think we're in um, a period of, of transition, if you like, at the moment. Um, we don't, I don't know whether how much leadership is, is going to change. So clearly before COVID we had, um, and I'm talking across all sectors now, uh, people came to the office um, and, and teams worked together, physically located together. And so that made leadership quite easy. And then we went through literally overnight, everyone was thrown into the same position where we were 
we had a remote workforce and the army was no different, less those that had to come together for essential duties. And of course, that, creates its own, that created its own uh, challenges and, and you would have experienced it, uh, of course, in the, in the financial sector in your business. The challenges that overnight having to lead remotely. Um, and then now I think we're in the difficult period of, of that transition where some are demanding their workforce come back into, into, the, into the office. And I know some banks, in, uh, for example, uh, have requested that. Others are happy to work remote. Um, uh, uh, and many organisations are trying to work out this, this, this hybrid nature. And I think that's the difficult bit when you've got on-siteers and off-siteers and how you, how you lead a disparate workforce. Some who you see every day with that human contact that's so important for leadership and, and others at distance. Um, I think for the British Army, um, we will have an element of our, our workforce that will, will inevitably uh, gravitate to that hybrid working. But uh, for most of our, uh, uh, our field army, if you like, have to come together by the very nature of our, our profession. They have to be training and, and operating closely together. So it will probably be probably affect us less. But I think there'll be some interesting challenges. The, the, one, the one thing I would say about what I think COVID has, has done, it, it, in the army we talk about, um, when we talk about what leaders do, we say they often have to um, manage the competing needs of the task, the team and the individual. And I think historically we've been, all of us, um, uh, in the corporate world as well, been very focused on, on task, on the output, on, on productivity. And uh, more recently, greater focus on the team as well and the importance of um, uh, bringing your diverse workforce together and, uh, and, and, um, uh, and working collaboratively for, for the benefits of the, of, of the output. But I think what COVID has done is shone a light on the individual as well. Um, and, and that's not going to go away. And we'll perhaps come on to that and talk a little bit more about the individual nature of leadership. But I think leaders across all sectors now have a, a greater and responsibility and ownership to look after individuals as much as developing their teams and delivering the outputs of the company as well. I think, I think COVID has really energised that. And I'd agree with that. And I'd say all the challenges that you've outlined um, in a post-COVID environment are the same ones that we face yeah. in financial services or I think indeed in the corporate world. Um, yeah. You know, only, you know, it's, it's, it's changed, I think, the definition of effective leadership in that we need to really take into account the needs of, who, you know, the individuals who are now primary stakeholders, which are really the people. Yeah. You know, we always think of stakeholders as being the shareholders yeah. or the clients or the regulator, but I think increasingly it's the people, the individuals, the employees, our staff, mm -hmm. um, who have become very important stakeholders, I think, through this. Um, yeah. I think we also live in a, a, a especially now that there, there is a remote workforce, you, know, you can recruit from literally all over the world, yeah. so the... You know, and you're competing for talent, aren't you? So you've got to, to meet the needs of your, of your people to really get the best ta yeah. talent and retain yeah. that talent for, yeah. for the benefit of the yeah. company. And it's more than just meeting the needs. I would say it's really building a value system yeah. uh, and, and you know, a set of cultural values that people feel they can relate to, that they believe in, that they can connect to. Mm -hmm. That's what's important. You know, it's not just meeting their needs and accommodating you know, basic requirements in terms of work-life balance but really going the extra mile to, to create a culture that they believe in yeah. um, and, and for them to bring all of themselves to work, which is why you know, diversity and inclusion, the inclusion yeah. piece is so important. I think today being International Women's Day Definitely. is obviously a big focus, but yes, we have the same challenges. Well, perhaps we can come back to um, yeah. uh, some of the yeah. diversity and inclusion uh, pieces in a bit because I think um, clearly that's worthy of discussion today, but I think there's some, some fascinating perspectives that we're, perhaps we can compare in, in terms of your profession and, uh, and mine. I'd like to actually go back to um, the question you asked me about the, the UK, UK US relationships and, and, and differences. And obviously, you're uh, a CEO of uh, a company that has a global footprint. And so you, uh, and obviously, you've got a, 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 a rich cultural background yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm keen to get your perspective on, uh, on how leadership changes over different cultures. And, 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 and different uh, companies that, sorry, different countries that you deal with or different regions that you deal with? Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's an open-ended question. <laughs> so I would say that leadership in the corporate world, particularly in financial services, uh, I think is very influenced by perhaps the American perspective yeah. in the sense that the best known business schools in the world, the ones who have most honed this concept of leadership are, are mostly U.S. schools. Mm -hmm. Having said that, there are obviously some very good, you know, European uh, MBA um, institutions. Um, in terms of, you know, kind of applying a different cultural lens, 
I think part of leadership is this clarity of thought and the ability to articulate a coherent, powerful strategic vision for mm -hmm. the business. Mm -hmm. I don't think that changes across cultures. I mean, I think that clarity is always something that's a baseline requirement in my mind. But perhaps the way that you express it or the way that you um, mobilize your staff and your business to achieve it, that might be different culture by culture. Mm -hmm. And perhaps there's more assertiveness required in some of the Anglo-Saxon yeah. cultural environments versus perhaps um, you know a little bit more buy-in or subtle um, buy-in that that might be more typical of some of the Southern European cultures yeah. where very often it's less about one leader speaking loudly in order to get people to follow but more this idea that you implicitly convince people why it's the best thing to do so it's perhaps less about the, the clarity of vision and, and more the way that it's put into practice or the way that you would mobilize teams and, and, you know, and effectively execute. So, so I guess you, you're neatly leading on to my next question, actually, which is around strategy. Um, I wonder what your views are. How do, how do you define a strategy and, and its relationship with, with leadership and the role of the leader in driving, driving that strategy? Yeah. So I believe it's inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just don't think you can disaggregate strategy from effective leadership because I think part of the leader's role is to um, develop that strategy and articulate that strategy. Um, and it's really, really important that you bring that rigor and discipline in terms of that clarity of strategic thought. Um, so that, that to me is, you know, a really, really important part of the leader's role. But of course, the other part for me is, is more the EQ side of things, yeah. you know, um, convincing people. Uh, getting stakeholder buy-in, um, you know, ensuring that you understand how do you allocate roles and responsibilities across the organization. So I think one of our biggest decisions as CEOs is really the allocation of resources, uh, including capital. So it's financial, human, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, and that's critical, you know, because because we live in a world of finite resources. So you know, it's it's getting all those parts to to function in a way that, that there is that ultimate coherence um, in a world that is very fast moving yeah. and changing all the time. Yeah. So the other big challenge I think of effective leaders is really to balance the long term with the slightly more short term, this ability to flex when you need to, like no one saw the pandemic happening, no one you know, expected Ukraine, well at least most of the world didn't, Ukraine to be invaded yeah. in the way that it has been or attacked I should say. Um, and, you know, I think you've just had a series of black swan events, mm. which are events with a very, very low probability of happening. But these events seem to have happened in quite quick succession over the past decade. So I, I think what's a challenge for effective leaders today, certainly in finance, is this ability to develop long term strategic objectives that need to stay constant, mm -hmm. but, but, but still understanding what events might cause us to flex tactically or even sometimes revisit some of those long-term objectives without losing you know sight of the compass like you know we talk about moral compass but we're also talking about strategic compass that's really interesting i i, I compare to some of the dilemmas that our strategic leaders in the military have to uh, uh, face particularly in terms of this short versus long term um and obviously military strategy needs political buy-in and political buy-in can often have a, a shorter time perspective you know we're working on five-year um uh, election cycles so it, it can it can tend to skew a, a favor of a short short-term perspective whereas from a, th a threat perspective we need to d develop an army or, and build a military that has uh, the ability to respond to multiple threat streams some of which we, we may not even know about at the moment so trying to get that long-term short-term balance is really difficult and i think a lot of firms are dealing with it now with with climate change is a really good example of where you're having to meet the the needs of the the short-term needs of the shareholders um, and deliver an output now, but you've also got to invest for for, for future challenges and this balance between, uh, I think, uh, um, the urgent and the important as well. It's really an in, in, interesting perspective. Um, we, we, we talk in the military about um, the difference between command leadership and management, and I was interested to get your perspective um, in, the, in the financial services and uh, whether you have a similar sort of uh, uh, breakdown of, of, of concepts. So for command for us is the the authority and responsibility and accountability that's invested in, in someone in a position of authority. Um, management is, is more about managing people and processes and resources, as you've alluded to. 
and, and leadership is that human connection and motivating people and inspiring people, as I said. And they're all, whilst we see them as different concepts, they, they, they overlap. If you're in a position of command, of course, you have to manage and, and lead as, as well. And I wonder whether what your perspective was for the uh, sort of corporate point of view in your experience. Yeah, so I, I suppose I draw the line between management and leadership. So I mm. think management tends to be more about processes uh, and people, of course. Um, and managers, certainly in financial services, tend to still be specialized in one area of the business, whether it's operations or whether it's um, um, you know, risk, oversight, or compliance. Mm. Um, whereas leadership is, I think, that piece that sits just, just on top. Uh, and I do think it requires the ability to, you know, as I said before, develop that strategic vision that cuts right across the entirety of the business in a very holistic way, mm -hmm. but in a way that brings all those pieces of the puzzle together, you know, in, 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 in a way that makes sense and that makes the sum of the parts so much more than the individual parts. Um, but yeah, I, I think we make similar, you know, we, I think we have similar, okay. similar concepts, I, I suppose, in, in, in the private sector, yeah. And do you think the private sector, from your experience, in, invests enough in its leadership? Uh, or, because, um, speaking to a number of friends in different sectors, you know, people tend to get uh, promoted upon their, their professional competencies and then reach a level perhaps where they may not have the leadership experience to really excel. Yeah. So I think that's true probably in every sector in the world. Yeah. 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 <laughs> where I think you do have people who sometimes just get promoted beyond their level of competency. So particularly true in finance, um, because it's an area where, you know, to do well, very often requires a very deep technical understanding mm -hmm. of the financial product or service mm -hmm. that we deliver. It's abstract, it's conceptual, and that tends to attract a certain type of individual, um, and it tends to be more cerebral. And, you know, as we said before, effective leadership does also depend on, you know, emotional intelligence yeah, yeah. and this ability to connect with people, to convince them, to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to really bring them with you on that journey. And that's not something that naturally falls out of you know, a, a progression path in financial services. Yeah, yeah. So you have a lot of CEOs who were chief investment officers before, you know, who were very good at managing portfolios or taking you know, decisions around buys, uh, you know, what, what to buy for clients in portfolios. Um, it's a very, very different skill set in my mind from the one required as a CEO, where of course you need to bring that technical understanding to the, to the fore but it's so much more than just that, um, yeah. Oh, I was, I was um, you made me think of a previous conversation you had, uh, we had, sorry, before coming on camera about the, um, the introvert versus the extrovert. I wondered if you could explain a little bit more about that and, and where you think that balance lies with it. I think you've alluded to it there, where, where that balance lies yeah. in the, in the yeah. financial services. Yeah. And that's an interesting one, because I think when you, when you talk about, or when people describe the typical CEO, it tends to be and again, it tends to be, I know this is changing, you know, male, mm -hmm. alpha male, so mm -hmm. someone who tends to be very extroverted, who has strong views, strong convictions. Um, you know, people talk about what makes a good CEO and very often one of the uh, ways a good CEO is described is they need to be bold. Mm -hmm. You know, they mustn't be afraid of doing things that haven't been done before. They have to be able to act, you know, without having full information. Um, they need to be able to take risk. I mean, of course, measured risk, but you know, it's, it's not something that you can just take risk away from. Um, and, and I think those are all the qualities that you would typically associate with an extrovert, you know, someone who's really good at communicating their vision in order to get buy-in. But this is where I think the introverts can add so much more because the introverts tend to be very thoughtful around um, you know, certain areas of strategy or um, other challenges. And so you know, I, I, this is why diversity is so important. You know, we're coming back to diversity that I think good leaders need to understand what are their tendencies and biases. And if they are these you know, quintessential, typical, you know, alpha extrovert CEOs, that they have to ensure they surround themselves with people who think differently and who will actually challenge them. And if they don't challenge, they need to seek that challenge. And can I put that question to you, yeah, yeah. Langley? You know, what, what about in the army? You know, who, who makes it to general? And is, is there also sometimes a bias towards you know, the, the individuals who just, just ooze that self-confidence and yeah. are very, very good public speakers and good at rallying troops. Yes. You know, do they tend to have an easier path to leadership or, you know, or, or what has 
or has that changed? I, I think so. Um, I think it is changing um, uh, because of the the, the, the understanding of the need for diversity and, and cognitive diversity, and perhaps we can come on to that. Um, but, but certainly, I think historically, and again, given the nature of the profession of arms, that ultimately we are requiring leaders to motivate people to put themselves in harm's way, mortal danger. Um, whilst that's not everyone in the army, you know, the, 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 the raison d'etre for the military and the army is, is exactly that. Um, I think it has promoted this concept of a more extrovert, more outwardly confident, charismatic individual, the alpha male type. Um, and particularly because we are a male dominated um, organisation and historically have been because of nature of uh, violence and men and society. Um, I think that's where we, we are today. Um, th that said, from my experience, the very best leaders I've met, um, I wouldn't class them as extrovert. I'd class them as confident, um, confident with managing risk, taking risk to exploit opportunity. A lot of the attributes you, you, you spoke about, they're decisive, but also empathetic. Um, the ability to communicate effectively with, with uh, our younger soldiers all the way up to our senior politicians. So I think the very best leaders I, I know, are, I would say have, which I think is one of the key qualities of a great leader, is that um, inner, true inner confidence, self-assuredness. And, and that, that doesn't necessarily boil over as arrogance or overconfidence, which can be forced and can lead to that alpha male uh, stereotype. But it's an individual who can, who can be decisive and be confident, in, but it all, can also be humble, is willing to listen, is willing to admit when they're wrong because they're confident in themselves. And they have that moral courage to do the right thing. But I do think, um, yeah, we tend to be on the, the right end of the spectrum of the introvert and extrovert. So I suspect that may well be changing. And, and do you reckon the Army has sufficient role models, you know, that display the qualities that you've just described? Um, I, I, again, I think it's changing, and I think this is a good um, uh, segue to, to, to talking about women in the Army as well. Um, because I think that's a good, there's a good example of where we are, have increased in senior leaders and uh, female uh, senior leaders. Uh, uh, full colonel, brigadier, and major general level now, uh, all of whom I think, certainly the ones I've worked with and I know, um, uh, are, are very comfortable and very self-assured in themselves um, and, not, uh, and don't feel that they have to put on this uh, persona of, 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 uh, of, uh, of some of the sort of typical uh, male characteristics that, that you spoke about. Um, and, um, and I think that's really important. Those role models are absolutely critical um, for, for the future generations to aspire to, particularly because we don't have lateral entry, um, or very little lateral entry in the, um, in the military. So we, we grow our talent from, from, from the ground up, although, again, the conversation about how that may be changing. So actually, for us, uh, changing those, those characters can be, um, all those characteristics that we see in some of our senior leaders uh, can take time because of the nature of, of, of our promotion system. But I think we are moving in the right direction. So where do we stand then today in the army with regards to women, you know, in, in, in front line, in combat situations? So as of 2018, so quite recently, um, uh, all roles in the military uh, are, are open to women. Up until then, uh, the ground close combat, so infantry and, um, and uh, armoured regiments, so those at the closest end of the fight uh, were, were not open to women. Uh, that, that narrative very, very quickly changed in, throughout the Afghan, Afghanistan and Iraq um, days. And I imagine a lot of people here from the military network will listen, will, will, a number of them would have had experience in that and will have served alongside um, some ex extremely capable, courageous uh, women uh, and men, of course. And I think that really, for us, changed it. And, but I'd say as an army, we were quite late um, among some of our peers to, to, to make that change. But where are we now? Um, we're 10% uh, in the army, 10% of women. Um, I think it's 12% across defence. There was a, a review by the House of Commons Defence Committee that was published in, I think, August last year that had a, it was quite a damning review of women in, in, the, in the armed forces. Had some um, very positive um, 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 conclusions. 90% said they would um, recommend a career in service to other women. Um, and, uh, and they recognised there are a lot of changes, but they, they still said there's a long way to go. And as Dr. Melissa Green, who is our, um, one of our uh, uh, heads of diversity and inclusion in the army, she said, we're at the, we're at the foothills of change at the moment. So, 
we're on the right path. We've got a strategy that the army has. Much of that's came about in, after the tragic death of um, George Floyd and the, you know, the conversations that were energized around, around the world of uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, so there's a great deal of investment. Um, so we're on the right path, but we, we need to speed up. I think the, is my final point on that, I think the, the latest ambition, level of ambition across defense is 30% of women in the army by 2030. So it's ambitious, but it's a right thing to do. But it sounds like your challenge is the intake because you have only 10% women. Yes. At the I, moment. So. Yeah, it's, it's about attracting, attracting yeah. the women and yeah. also having, yeah. as you say, the role models yeah. for people to aspire to, which yeah. is critical when you're trying yeah. to drive culture change yeah. in job the way. So yeah. how, how does that relate to the, to the financial services? Yeah. So, I guess there are so we have far more there. women joining, mm -hmm. but we seem to be unable to keep them you know, through their career progression, which is one of the big areas of focus of the diversity project, is to really try and understand where does this attrition take place. Mm -hmm. Most of the attrition takes place when women go and have children and then decide not to come back because they haven't been given either the flexibility or they just don't feel they're part of something bigger. Yeah. Um, and so this has been, as I said before, a huge area of focus of the diversity project. Um, and they've launched things like returners programs and support to women. Um, you know, they've, they've uh, talked about putting out certificates so that, 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 that women might be able to work, who, who, sorry, who worked in finance before, taking leave to have children um, might feel that they haven't really missed out on too much because mm -hmm. the world of finance continues to evolve. So, you know, not working for three or four years can sometimes be a problem. Um, but that's, that's you know, uh, our other big problem is I think the lack of role models. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of women who stay and become very good subject matter experts, but only the smallest minority make that leap from subject matter experts. So maybe functional heads to general management, senior management, executive management and CEO. And at CEO level, you have, you know, woefully few uh, female female CEOs at the moment in finance, and not just in this country, but generally. Um, and do you think the culture is changing ar around that? That the that, that's a positive culture that is in, encouraging women both to join and be uh, and re retain in the financial services. Yeah, I think it's changing, and I think one of the biggest changes we've seen over the past decade has really been this impetus created again by the Thirty Percent Project mm -hmm. to get more women on boards. So it's not unusual now to see boards where a third of the board members are actually women. Uh, I don't think that's enough. But what I will say is that it provides the, the, the opportunity for sponsorship, yeah. you know, for m far more junior women entering the organization. But also this idea that, you know, it's actually feasible, it's achievable, it's not just aspirational. Mm. You know, that women, you know, who join today as a 25-year-old or 28-year-old, they can actually make it all the way to board level if they, if they want to. So I think it's the power of, of that messaging, frankly, but what we need to do is just get more women, I think, in senior executive positions, um, and that we haven't, we haven't really succeeded. I think there's an interesting question about why diversity matters. Um, and I know we touched on it earlier in terms of that cognitive diversity, but I wonder what your, from your perspective, why, why do we need diversity? In a nutshell, I think it helps you make better decisions yeah. as a business, as a team, and as a leader. You just make better decisions. You know, because diversity does cr does does um, foster debate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and debate brings out different views and different perspectives by definition. And once you have different perspectives and you have that informed, collaborative, collegiate debate, you will get to better decision as a leader. There's no doubt in my mind. And you know, you just need to look back to some of the really, really bad decisions made over the past two, three decades. Certainly in finance, but I, I think even you know, beyond finance. Yeah. And very often these were leaders who were either narcissistic, you know, had hubris, um, didn't listen to others or simply created an inner circle of yes, yes men or yeah. yes people, yeah. you know, who never dared to challenge them. And that's when some of the worst decisions were made. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, um, I recently read Matthew Said's um, <sighs> a, a book, uh, Rebel Ideas, which I think yeah. absolutely nailed this issue about the importance of, of cognitive diversity. Yeah. Um, and, and, and to your point that you were alluding to earlier, and that's the importance of inclusion and belonging. You can have the most diverse workforce as possible, but if they, if they're not, they don't feel included, they don't feel belonging part of the team, feel valued and have yeah. a voice, yeah. then you're not going to leverage the power of yeah. that diversity. Yeah. Not only you don't leverage, I think you lose them over time because they don't feel connected in the way that you want them yeah. to feel connected. Yeah. So I think that's one thing. And I think the other thing is, you know, if it's not a safe, inclusive space, if the workplace is not safe and inclusive, you're only going to get a small fraction of that diversity being expressed. Mm -hmm. 
most of it they'll retain because they feel that they're different, yeah. you know, and that, that perhaps their views are so different that it's not valued, or if they express those views, and you know, that that might have adverse career consequences. And this is why you can't have the benefits of diversity without first having the inclusion. Yeah. You really need to create that inclusive space for that diversity to express itself, because that's when you get all the benefits of diversity. And then this is why the two have to go hand in hand. Yeah. It relates back to Google's project altruism, was it, when they said that the, the key quality of a high performance team from all their research was psychological safety. Yeah. yeah. Just having that environment yeah. of and trust. And trust. Yeah. Absolutely. The yeah. glue that binds. Yeah. So before we go on to other things, I did want to come back to this idea of mission, mission command, mission command yeah. and trust mm -hmm. and how that has evolved over time. Maybe you could just explain what that is, but that to me is a really uh, relevant point, I think, for, for so, the private sector. So mission command was a concept that um, the German army developed long before us, about 100 years before. Um, and then the Americans shortly after Vietnam, and we took it on in the, in the 1980s, and it is our command philosophy. And what it says is that we, in, in simple terms, we tell people what to do and why, we don't tell them how to do it. And we, so it's about the leader or the commander, the person in the position of authority, giving their in, in, intent and then empowering their people to, to, to bring their knowledge, skills, experience, character to, to the problem in hand and empowering your people to deliver that, all within the set of, of, of boundaries and resources, whatever you, you set out. Um, but critically, it's not about delegating and leaving your people to it. As the leader, you're always there in support. And you always maintain the ultimate responsibility, although you're dele delegating uh, control uh, to, to your team and the responsibility for them to deliver. Ultimately, you are still accountable as the, the leader. And that's a key point that some people sometimes forget. And of course, that relationship then relies on both the leader and the follower. People don't always like that term, but I think it's, um, we'll talk more about that. Um, but the leader and follower and that relationship between the two. Um, and that's why trust, as you, to, your, to your point, is, is absolutely critical. Um, and if you don't have the trust, you're not going to work effectively with the team. So if, you, if you've got that trust, that en enables you to, to, to um, empower your people appropriately. Um, and I would say that en enabling trust starts with the leader. You, you've got to come at it from the mindset of, of trusting your people first, rather than having to earn their trust, if that makes sense, rather than the other way around. So um, I think it was Patrick Alencioni and his, his Great book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Um, and at the bottom of the triangle, which you all know well, absence of trust is, is, the, is, is the one thing that will, will break, a, break a team. So it's absolutely critical. Um, but yeah, I think it's that relationship between um, the leaders and followers. And, and you will have worked in high performance teams yourself, and it's almost visceral, that energy you can feel when you're working effectively together. It's really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. really powerful. And how does that underpin the importance of accountability so you talked about you know the fact that the accountability doesn't go away even though under mission command you still allow your yeah. teams to figure out how to do things yeah. but you as the leader retain that accountability absolutely so you as the leader are still held accountable for for the outputs of your team and what they what they do and what they don't do um, and uh, but, but I'd also say that accountability so you are the is ultimately your responsibility but it also, and here's the point of followership, I guess, it's also that the followers, if they are, are empowered, they also need to feel accountable themselves. They've been given this trust by, by the leader. They've been given this freedom to, to deliver the output of whatever uh, the task is in hand. So I think there's also an onus on, on the, the followers to, to have that sense of responsibility and sense of accountability um, to, to, to the leader and to the task in hand. So again, it's that sort of mutual relationship. I do think um, um, I think followership is an interesting concept that that isn't talked about enough. We talk a lot about leadership. There's a lot of uh, books written, and and and, uh, and there's a lot of leadership development programs. But I do feel that we need to talk more about followership because there is um, you, you can't have one without the other, and 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 people don't like the term because they often think it's about blind obedience and so 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 they'll. Um, uh, obedience and it's not about that it's about people being proactive about being uh, professional uh, loyal and respectful to 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 their leader but also willing to challenge having the moral courage to stand up and challenge when uh, and have a voice as you said um, um, so it's a i think there's more we can do to develop uh, followership in in all organization particularly dare i say if in 
live in this in a world which feels increasingly individualistic um, and, and given the nature of, of the society we live in, the prevalence of technology, people are, are empowered more than ever before. And I do fear that um, uh, we may fa we may face a, a crisis of followership where people feel they, they lack that sense of responsibility and accountability to others. Um, so we live in interesting times. We do. I mean, what strikes me as I listen to you at speaking, Langley, is the, the single biggest difference, perhaps, between the military and certainly financial services is one of our incentives would be you know financial incentive at the end of the year in the form of bonus and that's not something that you would have in the same way in the army so you know this idea that to be an effective leader you need to be able to uh, develop followers and you know manage those followers you can't rely on the incentive system in the same way that we can in the private sector yeah. Um, so w what does that mean for the leader? Like, how does a good leader in the military actually create those followers? And, you know, is it something that, that relies on time so that he can prove himself over and over again that he has their best interests at heart, you know, in order to, for them to know that he's an effective leader and they will follow him? Uh, can that erode over time if he's not an effective leader? H how do you think about the incentive? You know, what motivates the individuals to actually be followers? So I think, to a certain extent, not having that financial incentive is an advantage, um, because we, because I think really what we we do by by the nature of the profession is tap into that uh, deeper value system, a deeper connection with people, and I guess that comes back to servant leadership. You know, as leaders, we serve the, the needs and interests of our people. I was going to get on to serve yeah. leadership, but you said it before I did that. <laughs> yeah. so, but I think that's it, isn't it? It's about it's about understanding what your what your what drives your people, what motivates them, where they want to be, where they, how they want to be uh, developed, and it's about challenging your people and developing your people for their benefit and for the benefit of the team. But simply, it's about knowing your people and doing your best by them. It's really simple, intrinsic human behaviour. At the end of the day, we all like to to feel valued. And, um, and, and cared for and looked after. And if we can do that in the workplace, then we're going to feel loyalty, we're going to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of inclusion, a, a sense of um, you know, wanting to add value back into that team, that organization, that company. Um, and so I think that's, you know, we, you know, we, we, by the very nature of the way we develop our people, um, we, we have play a great, uh, we have a lot of emphasis on, on that human to human relationship building teams. Um, and, and of course, through our training and, and our education, but particularly our training, we put people through some some pretty um, challenging environments, physically and mentally, that enables them to have those uh, gel those connections quite quickly. But I guess uh, you know, I guess a question back to to yourself in in the, in the same vein: um, how how do you in the in in the corporate world, but particularly in finance, how do you try and create those more mature? Uh, relationships with your people and that sense of belonging beyond just financial incentives and is there a, a drive to to really tap into to to to, to, to people's individual needs and rather than I think there has to be You've absolutely to, I mean I feel like financial incentives only go so far mm. but if you want to retain attract and retain really good people it's all about creating that culture that that they you know again that they can relate to so how do we go about doing it? I believe very strongly in the concept of servant leadership, you know, which is this idea that you don't micromanage people. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're competent and they know what they're doing, you let them get on with it. Um, trust is critical. So it's not just trust that we need to have, you know, that our clients need to have in us, because finance, again, is about abstract products and you're kind of selling either past performance, but you can't commit to future performance. Yeah. So the client ultimately has to trust you before they engage with you. And that's something that's very specific I think to financial services um, whereas you know I think what's as important is the trust that you know leaders have vis-a-vis -vis their teams and vice versa um, so yeah I, I believe very very strongly in that concept of servant leadership I always think my job you know if, if I have good people working for me then it's about ensuring that everyone's clear on where we're going as a firm as a business mm -hmm. and then everyone's clear on the role that they need to play to get us there um, and then I let them get on with it um, you know, and if anything, I, I always, you know, think they sometimes have fantastic ideas or, you know, um, insights yeah. in terms of how we might collectively do things better, how I might do things better. Yeah. So I think it's a real two-way dialogue all the time. 
Um, and it's fast moving, you know, so we, I mean, I'm, the, the army's the same, but you know, our environment changes day to day. Mm. Uh, you know, look at the events of the past seven, seven days mm. and the impact on financial markets. Yeah. You know, so things go quickly. We have to be agile. We have to trust each other in order to change direction effectively. Um, and we have to be very, very clear on where we need to go as a team as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, th I think it's a really big part of motivating people, you know, creating that team cohesion, um, you know, facilitating them, just, just removing the roadblocks. Yeah. And I say a big part of my job is just removing the roadblocks yeah. and motivating people and making sure they know I have their back. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that, 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 that point you said about agility as well, something we rely on heavily in the army. So you, you know, you've, you've got that common thread, that common purpose, understand, people understand their raison d'etre, what they're there to do. And they are they are a cohesive team, and that enables you to be agile and, and respond to the, the multiple challenges and complexity that we increasingly face, which is uh, particularly um, particularly relevant in this um, in, in current events. To finish off or close yeah. our, our fantastic uh, interview today, I've got some quick fire questions for you both. Yes, um, so so short answers to these. But um, firstly, what's the most important skill? A leader in both the military and the civilian world should have. Perhaps I'll come to you first. Um, skill. If it's a skill specifically, I'd say judgment, um, because I think the art of leadership is about balance and judgment. How much you trust your people, um, how much you empower your people, understanding the context, changing your leadership style accordingly, and, and, and judgment. Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> you should let me go first. <laughs> I think I completely agree. Oh, okay. I think it's all about judgment. And in fact, when I hire people, it's their judgment. It's, it's about the judgment, the ability to have good judgment. Yeah. It's good to hear. Yeah. Does it automatically follow that a good military leader will be able to lead in a corporate world? Do I come to Alex? Like oh, so what do you think? After this conversation, yeah. I'm inclined to say yes, because I feel that we have so many parallels. Um, and there's so much commonality in terms of how we define good leadership um, that I, I would think yes. Good to hear. I, what do you think? I would say uh, I would say yes as well, but I think it requires a, a military leader stepping into the corporate world to have a bit of humility and a, and a willingness to learn and adapt. Because it goes back to my point: the fundamentals endure, the context changes, and if they're if they're willing to appreciate the different environment which they're working in then all the skills and, and attributes, leadership attributes they've, they've learned and developed, they can absolutely bring that to the fore. I remember very early in my uh, financial career being told that I have to be like a sponge, take it in, yeah. take in everything I possibly can. Yeah. And and I hope to be. And that's an opportunity. Isn't it? Absolutely it was. Yeah. And some leaders, this is maybe a topical one, some leaders amass huge followings, but are not necessarily what we would describe as good leaders. Why is that the case? So I think this is the point that we touched on earlier when we talked about, you know, the typical extroverted, you know, maybe alpha male mm. type leader and maybe those are the ones who, you know, you're referring to. So I think it's not the case because they do, those are not always the leaders who, even though they have a large following, will welcome challenge from their inner circle. They're not always the best listeners. They tend to be very good at communicating one way, but don't, don't take in what might be communicated to them. And then I also wonder around, you know, I always go back to this, this, this importance of strategic clarity, this clarity of thought that's critical. You know, you need that coherence. You need that, that the, the, the logical development of a strategy that makes sense. And, and sometimes these leaders who are, you know, so, so, um, you know, g g um, concerned with creating followerships, they tend to have bigger egos. They don't always bring that rigor and discipline, I find, to their own strategic direction, or maybe it's not as, as, as thought through as it might be. I totally agree. I come at it with a different perspective in, in that um, I, I wonder whether, um, you know, people talk about living in a polarized world, and I think some of, some of the events around um, Brexit and, um, and the US elections in 2016 were good examples of where you had certain figures who had significant followers um, regardless of what you think of some of those of those of those characters and their and their and their moral judgments should we say um, but uh, but I think that uh, those individuals tend to also to have quite a lot of people that don't follow them um, and have an uh, opposing views but it's interesting when true leaders come to the fore and I'm thinking of President Zelensky now in Ukraine 
uh, people seem to be united around the, the power of his leadership. And, um, and Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in, in, uh, during COVID, another great example where, you know, I think truly great leaders, everyone seems to hear around and really recognise the, the, the power of their ability. It's almost like they have a gravitational pull. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Were there any questions on Slido? Yeah, we do have a, a, a live audience um, listening today. And there's, there's, there's two. I think the first one's for you, Alexandra. Um, which is, so when you are either the hiring stage or promotion stage, um, looking to recruit uh, leaders into organisations, be, be that team leaders or, or more senior leaders, um, how do you ensure that you are hiring people with those true leadership skills? Is it through an interview process, um, or is there any other way to, to ascertain whether people have got those skills, particularly externally? Yeah, so we obviously have a, a very structured interview process, um, you know, before we bring people into the organisation. Um, although having said that, we have a number of um, entry-level programs for work experience that don't have as structured an interview process. Um, but, but, you know, back to the first, the, the interview process candidates, I, I suppose one of the questions I often put to people is, tell me about how you managed through a situation that represented adversity. You know, when either your manager took decisions you didn't agree with, or something happened as an externality, that forced you to take action? How did you think about doing that? How did you rally either your team or how did you respond? Um, so again, it comes back to judgment because that's where I'm just trying to assess their judgment, um, particularly in situations that are not uh, planned. Um, and then there's one, one final question from Langley, and I think it's from, one, one from you. It presumably comes from someone who's on the, 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 the trade community team, but so it says it, it, here at Traders there was a scheme for uh, kind of a lateral entry army um, into traders um, could the military do the same vice versa taking people who've been in the city for a certain period of time into into the military or, or elsewhere yeah I, I definitely think that there's there's more the the army and the military more broadly can do in terms of um, leveraging the experience of, of others where they would come from and, and where they would enter into into the military from from the corporate world financial services to be debated um, there are lots of programs now within the army and the military again more broadly that seeks to to give experience of military personnel in in other organizations so working for a year with a particular um, a, a corporation or cross-sector leadership development programs like the Ford Institute for example as well as our diversity networks that, that work cross-sector so I think there's lots of opportunities to, to, to leverage the experience of others but um, I, I think as the conversations go on about how we um, um, attract talent at different levels of the, of the organisation. There's certainly a benefit in, in, in people coming from the financial services and supporting the business side, certainly, of our, of our organisation. So that only leaves me to say a huge thank you uh, to both Alexandra and Langley for these fascinating insights into the meaning of leadership in both the corporate and the military worlds. We hope you have enjoyed uh, this uh, lunchtime session and we look forward to seeing you all at our next diversity project event. Thank you again. Thank you.